Mark Andreessen uh, has created not just one but two billion dollar businesses uh, and now he's investing and creating billion dollar businesses uh, through Andreessen Horowitz, uh, affectionately known as A16Z uh, on Twitter and I believe the reason is because there's 16 letters between uh, the A in Andreessen and the Z in Horowitz. It's an IQ test for the entrepreneurs and you just blew it. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to like blow your screen there. Um, so we're going to have a romp uh, through some various different topics. Um, I would say that Andreessen Horowitz is probably the most innovative uh, venture capital firm that's north of uh, $500 million. Uh, we'll see if there are others uh, during the conversation that come up. Um, you guys have only been around for three or four years? Four years. Four years. You're managing about a billion and a half under capital? Three billion. I'm sorry. What the hell? <laughs> three billion dollars. Uh, can you be innovative and uh, interesting with three billion dollars? Isn't that just going to automatically make you, like, you know, very slow to change and, like, getting fat and happy on management fees? Yeah. Yes. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Done. We'll see you later. Well, Inter nice Inter Inter Interview is done. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, you guys started out as a much smaller fund. Yeah, we did. I believe 300 million or so when you first got off the ground. Yeah. Uh, so what's uh, what's the deal with three billion dollars? Yeah. So, so I mean, we have the huge advantage that we're new. I think so. We, we we basically we had a chance to kind of think from scratch, and we came up with a whole bunch of ideas on how to do things differently. We tried a whole series of those things. A lot of them, I think, are working. Um, some yep. of them, uh, some of them, we we were either deferred. Uh, aren't working as well, but uh, some of them are working. Um, and then I, I think the other thing was just simply timing. We right. actually raised our first fund in March of 2009, which, for those of you who remember these things, was at the low of the NASDAQ. A little bit of a tough time Coming out of the, the financial market. crisis. It's a little yes. bit like going public in Q1 of 2001, <laughs> which I also did completely, <laughs> completely accidentally. I wouldn't recommend either either strategy. Next, next time you try and make a big move, let me know. Yeah, you definitely want to, whatever, you want to show, you want to be on the other side, whatever that is. So, um, so we, I think, I think just, in retrospect. Just for a second. Yeah. You've done rather well. That's an understatement. You returned 2x your first fund in about three years? So far. So far, yeah. Realized uh, so far and then quite a bit, that, obviously, le left to go. not bad. Um, yeah. I, well, I mean, again, I think that, I think that, um, I mean, I, th I think we're doing, I think we're doing a good job, but I also think we got good on timing. Uh, we got lucky on timing, uh, which right. is that, you know, 2000, actually, it's funny. We, we sort of raised money from some very, very uh, 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 a, uh, supportive and tolerant uh, LPs. Uh, a couple of whom you I, actually. I would imagine if you're returning two x in three years, they're going to be goddamn tall. Well, now they're now they're a little bit happier. At the time, they were they, they took a big chance at us, and we we really appreciate it. Um, but it's funny, right? And actually, this conference is in I think that same setting, and what you guys are doing is in that same setting, which is you know it's it's we basically raise money right as the legendary ten years of bad, bad venture capital performance right. were kind of kicking in. In fact, the in fact right as we were raising money, the last good vintage year of 1999 was rolling out of the numbers. So so that's like fascinating, right? Everybody right. knew that. Crap had come down in 2000, but it actually took the 10-year reporting Ten cycle That's right. for the LP community to really respond. Like, oh, hey, there's some problems in venture capital that we just realized because the 10-year reporting cycle. Well, I think they were. I think they were incrementally figuring it out. I yes. think they were. I think they were. Uh, I think they were aware of it. But okay. it, it, it really, they, they really do. The large institutions manage money on a 10-year rolling basis. They look at performance on a 10-year rolling basis. And by the way, I think it's healthy that they do because the nature of what we do is long-term. Long you know, ventures are long-term, and so 10 years is good. And in fact, longer is, is probably even better. Um, but yeah, when you just looked at the numbers in 2009, 2010, they were awfully sobering. Um, you know, our argument was, you know, we had a different approach, but our argument also was the business is cyclical, um, and that, in fact, the appropriate response to 10 years of bad returns is to expect good returns right. going forward, not more bad returns. And that's sort of been the history of the industry, and I, I think, frankly, that will continue. So you've been at it for uh, three or four years now, and you've obviously been an operational entrepreneur for, you know, decades. <laughs> um, there's a few things that... Uh, it seems like you guys are doing right. What, what would you say are sort of the top two or three things, the way that you are different than maybe other big VCs or where you feel like you're investing the most time and energy? So the place that we've really tried to distinguish ourselves is on a very specific focus, which is the founder CEO. Um, and so we sort of have this idealized model that actually goes back to IBM, Thomas Watson, or DEC with Ken Olson, Microsoft, Bill Gates, Oracle, Larry Ellison, more recently, Mark Zuckerberg, Larry Page. Steve Jobs, we have this kind of idealized entrepreneur who's like a triple threat, a product creator, 
who is then entrepreneurial and starts a company, and then who then can run the company, who can be the CEO. So when you say run the company, I assume that means scale up a large organization. Yes, exactly, and run the company for decades, ideally decades, right? The, 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 many of the big technology franchises are run by their founders for decades. Some companies like Hewlett Packard had two founders, each of whom were CEO for decades. Intel had three, right? They, they really hit the jackpot. They had Noyce and Moore and Grove, all of whom were able to run the company. So they had founder run company for 40 years. Um, uh, so uh, you have this, you have this, you have this um, sort of amazing sort of thing that happens when you get that kind of founder with the kind of team that they can often build around them, you know, in the right market at the right time with the breakthrough technology. Like that's kind of the magic. In our view, that's how the long-term franchises get built. Now, we're not religious about it. There are breakthrough companies where the founders either can't or won't run the company, and there's a whole approach that we have for for, for how to cope with that. But our our, our sort of Platonic ideal. Uh, is the founder CEO, and we basically we've essentially built we've, we've tried to build our firm to be the best possible partner for the founder CEO. Not to name any names, but there's probably at least one other notable uh, large VC on Sand Hill Road who maybe has a little bit more draconian philosophy on keeping CEOs in the CEO chair. It's become fairly well. It's, this is sort of what we observed in the '90s: is it it, it 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 had become accepted wisdom, I think, broadly in venture capital, not across the board, but broadly in venture capital that founders can't run companies. Right. Um, and, and our view on that, by the way, by the way, by the way, the data supports that. If you just like flat look at the, if you look at the batting average data on founders running their own companies, the, the, the data is terrible. But of course, to us, that's just a reflection of the fact that if you look at the batting average of all startups, the data is also terrible, right? right? Most startups fail, therefore most founder-run startups fail. So, so in our, we're not looking at the failure data, we're looking at the success data. I think a lot of other people had been looking at the fail, failure data for a long time, and I think there had, there had been a loss of faith. And then there was this theory that there was this other model, right, which is sort of the, you, you either fire or sort of uh, demote the founder, and then you bring in the, See, everybody from the 90s will remember the world-class professional CEO, right? Never just an average. You never bring in an average professional CEO, even for your little company. It's always <laughs> a world-class, uh, which is key because that justifies the recruiting fees. Um, and so, um, and, and so you, and, and a lot of companies in the 90s, right? A lot of companies in the 90s did this, and they brought in, you know, some really, really good people. And there were some great success stories out of this: John Sigmore, John Chambers. Meg Whitman, you know, there were a bunch of great success stories, but there were a lot of companies that blew up uh, uh, after that, and we kind of traced it back and said, well, you know, a lot of those world-class professional founder CEOs, they may have been very, very skilled at being a general manager uh, at a big company uh, or in a big sales job somewhere, but they weren't going to do what Mark Zuckerberg was going to do, or they weren't going to do what, you know, in the old days Bill Gates had been able to do. Um, and so we just decided to take the other side of that. So I, I know there's at least one or two other areas where you guys have kind of pushed on. I, I, one theme throughout the day has been uh, what are VCs doing on the non-capital side of the equation, yeah. uh, particularly sort of you know taking the management fees that otherwise might go into their pocket or go home right. and putting them back into the company. In fact, I would argue that you know if venture capitalists believed as much in their firms as the entrepreneurs, they'd be reinvesting their management fees in the company, paying themselves as little as possible while they're growing the firm. Um, and some, some do that, but you know, as you know, some do that. But some do that, some certainly yeah, some do don't. not. Some do don't. <laughs> right. um, you guys have been staffing up quite a bit yeah. on recruiting resources yeah. and biz dev, corp dev yeah. resources. Yeah. Um, why are you doing that? Why do you think that's strategic? So it goes back to the, it goes back to the idea of the founder CEO. So we, we basically said, if you got a founder CEO, like a lot of the times the founder CEO, sometimes the founder CEO has done it before, and you know, we, we love that situation, but a lot of times the founder CEO of the breakthrough companies, they haven't run a company before. Often they've never been a manager before, and then there are cases where they've never even had a job before. Um, like literally, like not some, even. Some of us can't keep a job. It's, some, a, yes, it's exactly. a different story, yeah, really. Exactly. Um, and so uh, you've, got this, you, you've, you've got this dynamic where you know, they, do, they do need a lot of help. And so we, we, we kind of looked at the, the, the sort of spectrum of the kind of help that we thought that they needed and that we could provide. And we basically broke it into two parts, basically what the general partner can do, um, that's going to be the person who's going to be on their board, and then what the firm can do. So on the GP side, we basically made the decision that all of our GPs are going to be people who have done it before, right? Former operators, uh, people who have been either CEO or founder or some kind of background like that, okay. where they're sitting on the board, they can, they can advise. On the firm side, we decided to basically build the network. Um, and the way that we think about it is we want to build the same kind of network that John Chambers has, um, but we want to build that for all the founder CEOs that are running companies for the first time. Um, and that network is across five areas, um, executive talent, engineering talent, sales uh, or large company relationships, corporate development, fundraising, M&A, and then marketing and PR. And we have 50 full-time professionals across those five 50. groups. 50, five zero, yeah. 
right. and, and we're basically pre-wiring the ecosystem around these companies so that when our founder you know, shows up and says, you know, I need five beta customers for my new security product and I don't know any CIOs, no problem. We know who, the, we, we know who to hook them up with. Same thing with launches, same thing with fundraising, and, and, and so on, kind of all the way through the, 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 the steps. So, you know, I'm not going to ask you what the comp structure is for those 50 people, but I'm assuming that's at least 10 million, probably closer to 20 million in reinvested capital. They're well paid. Just on yeah. the headcount. They're well compensated. So these are, these are professionals. These are professionals. They're, a lot of them are former, like, in the, on, the, on, the, on the company side, what we call market development, which is sort of sales BD. Like, they're former top-end sales uh, people, uh, top-end product marketing people. In the recruiting side, top end former executive recruiters. Um, we market, uh, our partner on the marketing and PR side used to run Outcast, which is one of the top agencies. And so these are kind of top end people. Got it. Um, you guys have also not been shy about uh, branding and uh, maybe a little bit of swagger. Uh, your partner, Ben Horowitz, uh, notoriously blogs with uh, rap lyrics. Yeah. Uh, near and dear to my heart, I really appreciate Ben's. Posts. We're usually able to get him to put the little exclamation points and the asterisks in <laughs> instead of the actual words that are in there, but we work on that. He, he doesn't have any beat on red bold fonts, but that's about it. Yes. Um, you're not apologetic at all for the way that you're going after it. Uh, you guys are swinging for the fences. That's pretty clear. Um, one thing that's kind of come up a little bit uh, in the last few years, uh, Eric Reese's philosophy around lean startup uh, seems to be... Uh, the popular Kool-Aid that's being drunk by a lot of folks. I think uh, Ben, at least on one occasion, has kind of talked about himself as the fat startup VC, and I know you guys feel like, you know, raising funding, uh, raising a good bit of funding, uh, and really going after it um, is part of your philosophy. Maybe not necessarily that lean startup is the the one way to go. Well, any thoughts about you know going big? Does that require raising a lot of capital? Does that require really leaning in? you know, hard on things. Uh, what if the founder doesn't have the right concept on product market fit when they're raising a lot of capital or spending a lot of capital? Sure, so I think, first of all, I think it really depends on what you're doing. So it's very hard to give general advice to startups because it's very specific to the circumstance. The companies that we try to work with are the ones that want to change the world. Like we really do want to work with the founders that sort of have a view of how the world should work and it doesn't work that way and they can't rest until they make it work that way. Um, usually, in order to change the world, you need to you, you need to hit the market with force. At some point, you need to hit the market with force. Um, it's sort of the old thing of you know the world doesn't beat a better uh, beat a path to your door just because you have a better mousetrap. You know, every once in a while, something goes viral or something just gets automatically adopted. But for the most part, the things that change the world the world is a really big place, and it's very important at some point to saddle up and go out to the world, which means you know concepts like sales and marketing um, that you know that, that became dirty words at some point in the valley. Um, to do that, most companies that want to do that end up raising a lot of money because it's expensive to do that. Um, it makes sense to do that in a very cautious way. It makes sense to plan things out and be very sober. Uh, but most companies that want to have a big impact do that. The interesting thing about the lean startup philosophy is that I think it makes a tremendous amount of sense. Eric and I actually agree uh, on the following, um, which is uh, the lean startup philosophy makes a lot of sense at the, at the beginning of the company when you're trying to get to product market fit. In, in fact, I think the lean startup philosophy is, is essentially to, to startups what relativity was to physics. Like I think it's a significant advance um, in the thought process for how to run the company in the early stages. What we've been observing over the last few years is a lot of entrepreneurs who haven't worked in a company that has had a large sales and marketing engine and haven't actually seen what that means Basically, if, if left to their own devices, they would never do it, and, and you get all these you know, sort of sales is bad, and there's kind of this whole thing. Um, and the lean startup theory can get used as a crutch to not go do that stuff. Um, and then typically what happens is entrepreneurs then learn the hard way. They build the better mousetrap. The world doesn't beat a path to their door. They learn the hard way that it's not going to work without, without going into market hard at some point. And then they kind of have to go through that thought process and get educated. Um, and so one of the things we try to do is we try to work with that kind of entrepreneur and kind of get them through the thought process maybe a little bit faster. Right. They almost always come out the other side. It's just a question of whether they've wasted three years or let another competitor get the jump on them in the meantime. I think Eric is often quoted as saying, lean does not necessarily mean cheap. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, it's a, sta it's a staging, a product market fit is the pivot point, right? It's a, it's a, it's a timing and right. staging thing. So you're testing, basically trying to figure out things as you get to product market fit. If there is, you know, sort of state change, then you lean yeah. in hard. Yeah. Uh, raise money and go for uh, go for growth. And most growth companies end up raising three, four, five rounds of capital after after that point. Um, okay. The really big successful ones end up raising hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of capital because they're building an engine that can go to the world. 
that's a decision, by the way, the other thing I say is, like, that's a decision that people have to make that they want to do that. You know, the founder who doesn't want to do that, quite frankly, at some point should sell their company. And I think that's a fine outcome if that's really what they want to do, but I think it, it just, it caps what their company is going to be able to achieve as a standalone company. So there's been uh, quite an acceleration of accelerators in the last few years. Uh, the reduction in cost in building companies and the ability to get access to lots more customers has created just you know, incredible onslaught of various forms of startups. Uh, we talked uh, several times earlier today about the Series A crunch, uh, whether that's a thing or not, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. What, what's your view on that? Do you, do you feel like there's too many startups being created? Uh, and what do you think it takes to get to Series A? Yeah, so I think that there are two amazingly good things uh, that are happening uh, right now, and it's a consequence of all the seed funding and all of the um, accelerators, incubators, and all of the media and attention around them. Two, two really good things. One is the culture of entrepreneurship is spreading, uh, and that's happening all around the world, and I think that's a really, really big deal. It never, I grew up in Wisconsin, it never even occurred to me that I would ever be able to start my own company, uh, actually, until I just at, uh, happened to get to Silicon Valley and kind of discovered that there was actually a place to do it. And the idea that the idea of entrepreneurship um, can become something that many more people in the world can understand and choose to pursue, I think is incredibly powerful. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a very, very positive sign. The other thing that's very exciting as, a, as sort of now a venture capitalist is all of the incubated and seed funded startups are basically the, now the, you know, the world's biggest Darwinian experiment in new ideas, right? And so every single new idea that you could possibly figure out how to apply software, or internet, or mobile to anything anywhere in the economy, right? Somebody is trying it. And so it's like the ultimate petri dish. And it's actually, that was the good part about what was happening in the late 90s as well, right? But obviously the difference is in the late 90s, it was $20 million entry price to be able to try the idea. Right. Now it's, right. you know, it's half a million dollars or less. That's an amazingly positive thing. As a venture capitalist, we're thrilled by it because we get to see the results of the petri dish, right? We get to see you know, which, which guys crawl out of the dish and poke their heads up. That, and, that's and, all the work that I'm doing over exactly, here. Exactly, it's fantastic, we love it. <laughs> the consequence is that there is a crunch. I mean, the consequence is there are too many. I mean, I think just objectively, there are too many seed stage companies. There, there are just too many. Um, the good news is it's, I don't think it's a systemic problem. I mean, I think that I think people are gaining a lot of valuable skills. Um, I think that at least for the top seed funds and the top uh, accelerators, incubators, they're doing just fine. You know, Y Combinator, you know, by, ha by, by, you know, by having Dropbox and Airbnb and so forth is gonna have you know, spectacular returns over its life, despite all the ones that don't work. You, you know, same thing with you guys. And so, like, it, as a system, it's working fine, but it is important to be, I think, pragmatic that most of the, most of the seed companies are not, I think most of them just aren't gonna graduate just because there isn't enough venture capital right. uh, to be able to do that. I've, I've been trying to coin this new term called the MBA crunch, uh, which I think basically means that, you know, seem, seems like no one has any concern that everybody around the world is spending fifty to $100,000 on their MBA career, and that's, that's okay. Right. But if they spend fifty to $100,000 on their startup and fail, that's not okay. Right, and somehow they've learned nothing, and those skills aren't reusable, right? right? And they're just going to go and be drones. So, like, I, I don't buy it. So my soundbite is basically that I'd rather see you fail at your own startup than be successful about reading about somebody else's. Yeah. I think you're likely to learn a lot more failing at your own than reading about someone else's. Yeah. Um, so what... What do you think is looking positive about the global outcome? You talked a lot about building you know, world-class companies. Do, do you guys invest outside uh, Silicon Valley or outside the US? And are you bullish on the global picture? Or do you prefer to stay to your knitting and kind of focus on the US English-speaking market, or at least the developed market? Um, I am bullish on the development of the global economy and the developing world. Uh, I'm bullish in billions of people being lifted out of poverty. Um, I'm bullish in the creation of giant new consumer markets worldwide. Um, I am like I think that's that's all fantastic, and I think we're in for an amazing you know 30 or 40 years on that front. Um, I am also very bullish on Silicon Valley. Um, I, I view Silicon Valley as a network effect. I view Silicon Valley as a positive feedback loop, right? There's basically just it's a it's a sink for talent, uh, and on the margin, a lot of the best talent for what we all do you know ends up coming to the valley at some point. So. So I'm very bullish on Silicon Valley. Um, I'm very bearish on the ability for venture capital firms to scale geographically. Um, and so uh, I think that if we put... I'm trying to prove you wrong on that. I, I would love for you to prove me wrong. I, I would love to be proven wrong. And I have one more thing I want you to prove me wrong on. I'm coming to. Um, 
I would love uh, I would love to see it happen, um, and there are people who are working very hard on it. Um, I think at least how we operate is a very team oriented, and so having everybody in one place um, is, is I think turns out to be quite important. And so we're a single office firm; we only have an office in Silicon Valley. For what we do, I think that makes sense. Um, I think there are great VCs in many other parts of the world who we partner with and collaborate with, who are fantastic. And there are some high quality firms that are scaling geographically, and I and I, and I hope that works out well. Um, I am bearish, but wish that I were bullish on the idea of there being more Silicon Valleys. Um, I would like there to be 50 or 100 or 200 Silicon Valleys all over the world. I think it's much harder to create another Silicon Valley than it appears, and I think most of the attempts to do that have not gone well over a multi-decade period. Um, the good news is people keep trying, um, and there's a lot of new efforts you know, all around the world to do that. I would love to see it happen. Um, I think it actually is a pretty difficult formula to recreate and I hope that people are, to the extent that they want to pull it off, I hope that they're appropriately realistic about what's required to do it. Um, what about a place like Beijing and China? I'm yeah. assuming that you know, there is a lot of entrepreneurship going on in China. There's a huge uh, domestic market that doesn't necessarily need to be you know, uh, shipped elsewhere. Um, are you bullish on sort of the Chinese taking over the world or at least uh, becoming a very large you know, competitor Silicon Valley from software uh, talent perspective? So the Chinese startup, uh, China should be another United States from an economic standpoint and from a, from a startup standpoint, and Beijing, Shanghai, other places should be Silicon Valleys. Um, there's no question. This, this is an area I, I would love to see it happen. I think that the early indicators have been, you know, there have been some very, very amazing success stories. You know, it's Alibaba and Tencent and Baidu, and I mean, there have been some amazing results. Um, I worry about the system. I worry about the ability to sustain the process and actually have a system. And a lot of it has to do with the same frustrations that Chinese entrepreneurs will tell you on the ground, which is the issues with the, ch the rule of law. Right. Basic contract law right, is still a challenge in China. Um, IP uh, integrity uh, is still a challenge. Um, government, you know, there's this whole kind of theory that there can be basically a free economy without free speech, which I think is, is probably not true. Um, my concern is that the my concern is that the friction in the system itself will cause more problems than people think. Um, you know, in, in in the bad case, it, it goes sideways uh, from a social and cultural standpoint. In the good case, I think it, it, it develops. I'm not the least bit. I would love for <laughs> I would love for Beijing to be another Silicon Valley. I would love to have the problem where we have to our companies have to compete with more Chinese companies. Um, uh, I think that'd be fantastic. I think it's going to be more of a daunting challenge to get there than I think people think. Uh, we mentioned earlier this afternoon a uh, blog post you wrote called Software is Eating the World, uh, or I guess editorial for Wall Street Journal or New York <laughs> Times? Wall, yeah, Street, Wall Street Journal. Street Journal. Um, and uh, for those who haven't read it again, I would strongly recommend it. Probably one of the best pieces I've read in the last uh, year or two. And you know, to summarize briefly, your opinion is that uh, the software and tech industry isn't just for software and tech, it's for everything. everything. Uh, Jeff Lawson from Twilio gave a talk this afternoon about uh, software people and kind of that philosophy. Yeah. Um, if you're bullish about everything uh, becoming technology oriented, does that mean that you're just an investor in business, uh, not tech? So the core of the theory from an investment standpoint is that you've got, it's the smartphone, right? It's the smartphone and all the implications of the smartphone as well as the tablet and the PC, which is you basically say, what if we lived in a world in which everybody in the world had a computer with them all the time and everybody was connected? Which, by the way, is a world we've never lived in before, but it's the world we're going to live in now, right? And then that's, that's the thing that drives me nuts. You know, I debate with my friend Peter Thiel all the time, innovation is dead, and it's like, no, like, we're entering the world for the first time ever where everybody's online, everybody's connected. Like, we've never, Absolutely. ever lived in that world before. Probably five, six billion people in the world haven't had the opportunity to have uh, that always on education at your fingertips opportunity. Exactly, and it's, it's the magic, it's the, metaphor, it's the magic box. Like, they've got, they're gonna have the magic box where like, if they need to ask any question, get an answer. Like, <laughs> like amazing, right? Or, or connect to anybody, right? Be able to communicate with anybody, be able to participate in markets, um, all these things. Um, and so in that world, um, I think we, we being the software world, software people, as, as Jeff says, um, can look at many uh, categories of product, service, business, industry um, that historically have not been based on software, have not been our, our, the kind of thing we do. And I think we can think about how to reconceive those products and services as software. Um, I think that it's, again, it's very category specific. So I think like software is clearly eating media uh, right now at a high rate of speed. Software is eating retail. Uh, software is eating, uh, obviously, um, you know, large parts of financial services. Um, there are excellent prospects, I think, for software to eat education over the next few decades. 
Um, some areas get much more difficult. Uh, healthcare in particular is probably the hardest one. Uh, from a re just so much regulation, uh, you know, so hard to change uh, such a heavily regulated industry. And then there are the two really big ones, which is uh, suffer eats law, and then ultimately suffer eats government. And I think we have a long way to go before we get there on so that. But suffer eats venture capital. Suffer eats venture capital. Well, suffer eats venture capital is, is a very interesting topic by itself. Absolutely. Yes. Which, um, which so I'm guessing we'll have the chance to talk about. Uh, absolutely. No, yeah. Naval was here a little bit earlier today too. Yeah. Uh, you're very bullish about uh, we're just kind of in the early innings investing in the internet. Yeah. Um, do you feel like the public markets are going to be uh, favorably inclined to provide exits for all those investments? No. No. Not even a little bit. And so how do we, how do we get liquidity, how do we get return on all the money that we're putting into the system if that's not a friendly exit environment. Yeah, so well, one thing is, look, at some point, someday uh, in the future, the public markets will discover that they have eliminated all risk and therefore all growth, and they will, they will, they will change their minds, um, and there will be reforms and so forth, but that, I think, is some, some time off, and so I don't think it's good to assume that. Um, so I think, so I, think, I think that, and let me also say, like, I'm not, being, I'm not actually an absolutist on this, high-quality companies at a certain level of scale can certainly go public. Um, the way I think about that is when a company, I use the term fortress, when a company has become a fortress, when its business is large and stable and it has clear line of sight for the next three to five years, when it has a large IP portfolio, when it, has, you know, uh, when it doesn't ever need to raise money again, you know, those are all good times to go public. Um, and so there, there, there will continue to be public exits. Um, there will also, I think, be a tremendous amount of M&A. Um, you know, the, the really interesting thing to watch there is uh, repatriation uh, of overseas cash. Um, U.S. multinationals have unbelievable levels of cash on their balance sheet trapped overseas that right now they won't bring back because they'd have to pay taxes. At some point, there will be a deal where that money will come back, and a lot of it, I think, will be spent on M&A. So I think there's actually been a, an M&A bottleneck as a consequence of that. Um, and then um, the third thing and the, 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 the point, I think, under, under all of it is um, ultimately it's a question of real economic value, not stock price, right? right. It's a question of... Um, you know, real business performance, uh, and then it's a question of time frame. Um, and so I think the appropriate response to this kind of pressure and these kinds of bottlenecks is to adopt a long-term time frame. Um, and the reason that makes us so much sense is because everybody else in the world is on the other side and has a very short-term time frame, right? And so the investor who has the long-term time frame and is able to stick with things for a long time and build value for a long time is going to do really well, even if it's going to take a long time to exit. In fact, probably because it's going to take a long time to exit. I was just getting ready to say, you're basically arbitraging the volatility of the stock market itself by providing yep. large rounds of financing when the stock market might not be ready to you know, provide an exit for a company. Yeah, we like to say from a finance standpoint, it's sort of venture capital community and Warren Buffett are like the only long-term money in the world anymore. Like, we're, we're it. Like, we're it. Us and Buffett. And what's funny, of course, is he would never invest in anything we invest in or vice versa, unless you're going to invest in digital ketchup, which is possible. Um, <laughs> soft reads ketchup? Soft reads condiments? Exactly. Okay. Uh, side fund for 500 startups. But um, failing that, um, uh, you know, is diametrically opposed value investing versus growth, you know, sort of venture versus, versus you know, sort of you know, literally railroads, you know, kinds of stuff he invests in. But what, what we in venture capital and all of us have in common with Buffett is an actual long-term viewpoint. Now, he has a long-term viewpoint because he's the richest man in the world, controls his company, has more money than God, can do whatever he wants. We have a long-term viewpoint because we have no choice. We have to have a long-term viewpoint. It takes time to build these companies. Um, we have this marvelous fund structure where we're able to lock up our LPs uh, for a long period of time. We're fortunate in that we have LPs who themselves have long-term time horizon. Actually, the, the irony of how venture capital works, I think, it, from a sort of a social standpoint, is actually very funny, which is we, we the venture capital community, raises money from the world's longest-lived institutions, right? The university endowments, you know, Harvard and Yale, institutions that have been in business for 400, 500 years, right? Large foundations that are going to be in business for centuries to come. Um, and we basically route that money into the riskiest, you know, most dangerous, most volatile, right part of the economy, which is, which is the startup part. And we, it's sort of this, and then the profits go right back to the long-lived institutions. We skip, actually, interestingly, all the other money. Like, we just, we skip all the retirement money that everybody has. We, we skip all the money that the individual shareholder has, you know, stockholder has. Uh, but we're basically taking money from the, from the oldest of the old economy and moving it into the newest of the new economy. And that part works really well because the oldest of the old economy, those institutions have long-term time horizons. They know they're going to be in business in 100 years. And so they actually, they don't mind being locked up for 10 or 15 years. Um, the, uh, there's been a discussion around whether the appropriate venture capitalist is an operational venture capitalist or whether that person could come from a completely finance 
background and not be operational. I think Fred Wilson's probably the most classic example of someone who hasn't really been an entrepreneur but has had tremendous success as a VC. Uh, you guys definitely come from the operator side of the equation. Um, do you feel that's essential to sort of be in tech and be successful as a VC? Do you feel like operators are taking over? So I, I don't think it's, a, so I would say in addition to Fred, I'd say John Doerr, Mike Moritz, Jim Breyer, right? Many of the best venture capitalists of the last 20 years were, were not operators and, and have not run companies, have not started companies. So um, it has certainly been the case that there have been uh, many, uh, Andy Rockleff, who's a, one, of, one of our, was a great uh, venture capitalist for our company, LoudCloud. Um, you know, many of these guys have come through investing or from other areas, law, finance, marketing, and so forth, and, and ended up being great VCs. Um, I think for what we do, we need to be operators. And this goes back to the founder CEO thing. Um, I think um, if we're going to be on the board of somebody who has never run a company before and we're going to be giving advice on what to do, I think we have the obligation to have done it before. And that's the bar that we've set for ourselves. But I, I, don't, but, uh, but I don't think that's the only way to do it. Uh, I'd like to start taking a question or two from the audience. We have maybe five minutes or more to wrap up here. Uh, I just want to know, would you do it over again, the picture with the Google Glasses? Oh, of course. You got it. White, white guys wearing Google no, Glasses? No, number, one, number one, you saw it, which means it was a successful photo. I was photo. so jonesing to be in that picture after I saw it. I and and like, number two, you'll notice I was not naked in the shower. Uh, no comment on Mr. As Scoble's as compared, uh, as compared to a certain other famous viral photo. So I think on balance, it, it, <laughs> it, 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 I think on balance, it turned out okay. So, so to be a little bit serious, uh, you know, Google Glasses, interesting uh, vision for the future. No pun intended. Yeah. Uh, is this uh, cyberspace as it's going to exist uh, down the road? Do you feel like immersive, you know, cyberspace is finally going to get here? Yeah. So I mean, I you know, I, the first time I tried on Google Glasses, I fell in love. So. I'm a little giddy about the whole thing, but you know, there's the internet right in your field of vision at all times, right? It's like the most magical thing I've ever seen. So you're sure this is not the echo chamber? This is a mainstream use product. Th this, it's well. I mean, <laughs> could you imagine a world in which everybody's walking around all day like this, right? Well, that, that did happen. As it turns out, as it turns, <laughs> as it turns out, you can, right? Um, and so, look, I think if everybody's willing to have self, uh, smartphones and stare at them all day, then I think there's no question that something that just puts it in your field of vision is going to be is going to be extremely compelling. I also think we can start to see we can start to see what's going to happen actually after smartphones and tablets. I think, um, and I think it's and, and the, the vocabulary is too new to really really uh, have been standardized, but it's sort of wearable, ubiquitous, immersive are kind of all. Elements, and I actually think there's going to be a blend. I think it's actually going to go from devices you hold and carry. I think it's going to more towards either heads-up displays. Um, and, and by the way, Google Glass is not just a display. It's also a voice. Um, the, the voice in and out uh, part of the UI is equally important. You can talk to it. It talks back to you. The speech recognition is getting really good. Um, the, the huge investment Google's made in, in, uh, in natural language is, is really paying off. So there's that, and there's all the other wearable products that are coming out, and there's the you know the Jawbone and all the fitness uh, computers, uh, you know bracelets. There's the, all the wa all the watches, all these other things that will come out, um, and then I think there'll be the other part, which is sort of environmental computing, or sort of um, just uh, sort of ubiquitous, and so you know big screens on walls and on tables right. that are just always there, and they know who you are, and you walk up to them, and there's your stuff. Um, and that's actually, you're starting to see that actually happen. Um, there's a bunch, my, I'm on the eBay board, we have this thing where we're putting actually uh, large flat panels in retail space and you walk up to it and it's a whole online shopping experience right there in the retail space with touch control, motion control, voice control. Um, and so I suspect there will come a point where we actually don't need to carry anything around. Um, but that's probably, you know, that's, that's 10 years out. We're, we're starting on that process now, we've got a ways to go. Pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, any uh, questions from the audience yet? Um, right there, yes. Yeah, so just opinion from the both of you regarding software needing venture capital. Is that going to happen anytime soon, like three to five or ten years? And if not, what are you guys going to do about it? Yeah. So the question is around whether software eats venture capital, what are we going to do about it? Uh, I'll, I'll let Mark answer first. So um, there is the possibility that we're the most evolved dinosaur, um, at least speaking for myself, uh, and uh, the mammals are about to emerge. Um, so, and by the way, nobody gets more surprised by that than, than the dinosaur. Um, <laughs> if software were to eat venture capital, there's, there's two ways I can think of uh, in which software could eat venture capital. One, I think, is going to happen for sure, or is happening right now. 
uh, which is crowdfunding. Um, and I think that the crowdfunding revolution is amazing. I think Kickstarter is amazing. We're investors in CrowdTilt, which I think is amazing. Um, and we're seeing more and more startups that walk in, especially hardware startups walk in and they say, oh, I've got this great idea and $5 million of pre-orders, which I can tell you is a much more compelling pitch than just I have this great idea. Um, and so uh, I think crowdfunding is gonna become a major part of the, of the landscape for new companies. I think it's incredibly powerful and exciting. Um, right now, we're treating it as another validation step along the way. Um, we, we believe that companies will continue to need institutional uh, support um, and, and real venture capital, but that certainly could, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see, hopefully. Let's put it this way, hopefully if we're wrong, our investment in CrowdTilt will make up for the fact we'll be driven out of business. Um, <laughs> and then um, uh, the other, you know, as uh, Danielle, I think you had earlier today, right. um, and Not the guys right. at Google Ventures are working hard on the other side of this, which is sort of quantitative analysis. Big data for VC. Big data for VC. I'm excited about that. I'm an, uh, I'm an angel investor in AngelList, and also we're in, in Danielle's uh, company. I'm excited about the idea. Um, I would like for it to work. Um, we have been running a bunch of experiments internally trying to make it work using a lot of the same signals that people talk about now. Um, my best guess is that it will become an important component of how we do what we do, but so much of what we do involves things for which data doesn't exist yet, and so much of that involves people. Right. Um, and I just don't, I'm having trouble stretching my brain to figuring out how you evaluate and deal with and work with people um, without actually working with people. <laughs> um, and that's the part of the business that seems the hardest to just sort of wave a magic wand and make go away. Don't Venture capital of the form where people deal with people has been around for, you know, it goes back to Columbus, goes back, you know, it's, it's been kind of, you know, that right. th there is a component of investor bets on entrepreneur based on personal relationship works as a team for 10 or 20 or 30 years. I think it's hard to see how that goes away just because all of a sudden you can get right. quantitative. Don't you think we're not being ambitious enough as venture capitalists? I mean, I, I feel like, you know, we, we give advice all day long to other companies about scaling up and automating, and yet we ourselves, you know, very, very few venture capitalists have more than 50 people on the team or more than, you know, 10 people making investment decisions. Um, but there are plenty of examples of other companies that have scaled up in other areas. So why, why can't there be a Walmart or a Google for VC? Why, why can't there be a firm that is making thousands of investment decisions? Um, well, at some point, you have the question of how many good entrepreneurs, I mean, how many really good entrepreneurs are there with really good ideas at the right time? Um, and then, of course, as you know, the other issue we have in venture is the con at least we in our model have the conflict issue, right? Which is we can't we can't and we can't make primary directly conflicting uh, investments. And so there there are certain potential natural limits. Obviously, if there are more regions in the world, if venture capital expands into more categories, you know that helps. And so there is there is room to grow. I also think it's just it's creativity. It's what you, it's what you're doing. I think it's what we're doing. It's what Google Ventures has been very creative in the last five years. First round capital has been incredibly creative. Uh, a lot of the new seed funds have very creative approaches. Um, you know, venture capital worked really well a certain way for 40 years, and it worked really well <laughs> for 40 years. Um, and so um, I think that there's uh, the opportunity to play creativity against it. Um, the same way that there is in almost any other industry, and I think that's starting to happen. Do, do you think the LP community is not challenging us as VCs enough? I think uh, Mark Suster made a comment earlier today that the LP community tends to be concentrating its capital uh, more and more and not uh, allocating capital to emerging managers or smaller funds as much as larger funds. I'm not sure that's actually what's happening. I might have a different interpretation than he okay. does of the data. Um, there is concentration. So the number of venture firms is, is the number of venture firms is shrinking, but there are a lot of venture firms that were formed in the 90s that are still on the rolls that yeah. shouldn't receive more money and in many right. cases aren't even still operating. Um, and so there, and there, there's a certain shakeout. There's, by the way, there's other firms that are now in their third or fourth generation of partners, and at some point it's time to wind up shop, and some of those, some of those, some of those are winding up. So, so, so there's, there's, there's a truth to what he's saying, and that there is, you, you do see the number of venture capital firms shrinking, and you do see this kind of concentration happening, but at the same time, you see VC, uh, LPs being very supportive, uh, I mean, certainly of us, but also of, of some of these new firms, certainly uh, first round capital. It's a little easier to bet on some guys who've created two billion dollar uh, companies. Uh, but I'd point, I'd point, I'd, I'd certainly point to Josh Koppelman. Uh, the LPs have been very supportive of Josh, uh, who's brought genuinely new thinking um, and, has, and, has, and has applied his own, his own kind of scale to it. Um, and then also, you know, a lot, you know, it's really cool what's happening with the new seed funds um, that are getting funded. Um, and, uh, you know, we try to work with, with, you know, those guys as much as we can, but kind of across the board, the caliber of people who are starting these seed funds and what they're doing 
you know, it's almost like the seed funds are almost like the new venture capitalists in a sense. The seed funds are the point of contact with the entrepreneur when the company's first getting started. Mm -hmm. And the level of assistance and handholding and training and mentoring and connections that take place is very reminiscent of what venture capital actually was in the 70s and 80s before it got big. Um, and so it's, it's actually, I think it's very healthy. It's almost like a return, return to the roots that's happening at the seed stage. I think that's very healthy. Um, and then I think firms like ours can really help with scale. Like I think when, especially, I mean, we do a lot of seed investing, but where we really kick in is when a company's gonna scale and it's gonna have all the issues of scale, um, then we can, we can apply a lot of the, a lot of the leverage that, 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 that we have. So maybe last question. Um, you guys have definitely applied scale and automation to a few areas, recruiting, business development, corp dev, others that we mentioned. Um, what about engineering itself and maybe the rocket internet model? Yeah. Um, you know, wouldn't it be possible for you guys to employ uh, engineers directly and then when you see a big opportunity, you know, immediately bring 50 to 100 people you know, with operational capacity into that you know, area and hit that with force yeah. the same way that you do with the sales, marketing, recruiting side. Yeah, so uh, we have 100 ideas of things that we want to do we haven't done yet, and that is not one of them. Um, <laughs> We will never do that. Uh, we, will, we, will, uh, we will never do that. Um, the, well, I mean, there's sort of one obvious. I mean, the, rock, the rocket guys, obviously, there's the copy and cloning kind of thing, which let's, I, I'm separating let's that even, part of Let's it. even separate that out for yeah. now. The problem more generally with what you're saying is also the same problem that the actual incubators have, and certainly that the incubators had in the 90s, um, uh, which is, you, you, in our view, you end up with fake companies. You end up with fake startups. Do, do you think Bill Gross has been successful with Idealab? I think he has been successful when he has had the right idea and was when he has figured out how to put the right people against it. Yeah. Um, where he has been less successful is having fifty other sort of fifty other risk averse entrepreneurs. Just put yourself risk averse entrepreneur. The entrepreneur who's willing to trade fifty percent of the equity in return for the Idealab back office functions right. is a risk averse entrepreneur. Risk averse entrepreneurs should not start companies. This is sort of the, this is the problem at the heart of the incubator model. This crippled the incubator. If you're willing in the to 90s. let Bill Grace take fifty percent of your company, you shouldn't be running a company. That's what you're saying. You're risk averse. You've demonstrated through your behavior you're risk averse. Risk averse people should not start companies. The, the risk averse people do not. It, it's Mark not. Mark Zuckerberg would not have given up fifty percent of his company. Not a Bill chance. Gross. Not a chance. In fact, a very big part of Paul Graham's innovation with Y Combinator was it was I think eight percent, right, and not fifty percent, which is right. one of the reasons why YC works. I, I think was right. Paul was pitching us this morning on valuation doesn't matter. Well, <laughs> it depends. Valuation doesn't matter if you're investing in Google. Valuation matters for certain other cases. Um, but anyway, point being, um, you have to be very, very cautious. Uh, if you try to systematize this stuff, you have to have a real company come out the other side. You have to have a real entrepreneur. You have to have somebody tremendously passionate about what they're doing. You have to have a long-term commitment. You have to have bold risk-taking. It's very hard to synthetically manufacture that in a lab, I think. Uh, Mark, you're always uh, interesting and poignant. Thanks for uh, sharing some time with us this afternoon. Good, good. Thanks, everybody.